basically, I mean, to put it, you know, um, in vernacular, you can hack them very quickly. Just start yeah. coding and get the minutia. But you don't right. have any idea what it's really supposed to do, and then you run into the problem. So it's good for prototyping real quick. You know. Yeah, no, I mean, the, the interesting thing is also I really like prototyping in Haskell now because the difference between what works in the prototype stage and what works eventually is actually a lot smaller than some exactly. that prototype in one of these more flexible languages. Because, right. you know, you know, it'll be like, okay, you know, now you, you wrote it to work, but to actually get to work, it, this now has to live inside of a callback and take some arbitrary, you know, right. parameters and produce something else arbitrary. It's really, everything's nicely composable, I guess I should say. Yeah, um, yeah, it, yeah. It's a prototype to last, basically. Exactly. And the other one is a throwaway prototype, get something going, and if the thing succeeds, then you worry about the optimization yeah. later. You know, and, and, and that's where we believe this might be important. And also, you know, I have to, I have to kind of um, give credit where credit's due to the Haskell community because they've, they've also been great at releasing libraries that conform to the same API of other libraries or natural libraries. Um, and the one that I think that sticks out in my mind is like the vector library um, in many ways conforms to the same API as like the, 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 the base list, you know, array library. It's very easy to drop in replacements and test, you know, oh, does unordered containers uh, run my code faster than, than you know, hash map or whatever. Um, and, and that's pretty powerful as well because um, mm -hmm. you don't always know up front, like, oh, should this be, you know, uh, you know, I, I, I don't necessarily, I don't have the kind of computer science, you know, mastery of information that I can just say from the outset, oh, this data would work best in like a cuckoo hash or something like that. But Haskell makes it, you know, the, the libraries that the community have developed make it really easy to kind of just, you know, lift one out and drop drop another one in and see, you know, kind of gauge the performance thusly. We have a, we have a yet kind of in the works process, um, a books project um, that um, I can't entirely, I don't entirely know, nor uh, would I want to necessarily reveal exactly what it's going to be, but it involves our books, our, our entire books archive. And a lot of people don't know this, but I believe the first or one of the first um, uh, verticals the New York Times had was its book review. So we have over a hundred years of book reviews. Um, which is a lot of data. Um, we have just going back to, I believe, 1983, we have 40,000 reviews. Um, so we're probably looking somewhere around the order of 100,000 reviews um, uh, in, our, in our entire archive, maybe a little less. And um, I've been using Haskell to perform some analysis on the reviews to do things um, like uh, pull out common engrams and phrases uh, to you know, do some quote extraction um, to find reviews that reference other books and kind of put them together in a sort of graph. Um, so this is one project that um, I am already, uh, you know, uh, finding lots of, you know, uh, it's an easy fit for Haskell. It works really well. Everyone's impressed with how quickly I can turn around the results. Um, and I can, again, analyze it, you know, in, on, in different dimensions with changing very few things, run the same program in a small amount of time. And, and I benefit from that. Um, we have, I have this kind of ongoing project as well um, that we use from time to time that does kind of live Twitter analysis um, based in Haskell that basically it, it, it reads off of the Twitter fire hose, um, usually with some sort of uh, filter. Um, we, we like to use it for hurricanes um, and um, kind of break down those to see if any common trends pop out thus far, unfortunately. Um, it hasn't borne a lot of fruit, not because of, you know, the, the program or the idea, but it just turns out that um, often, at least, uh, often a lot of the people tweeting about hurricanes, uh, the, the quality of those tweets are pretty, pretty slow. A lot of times it's, it's not like, you know, in, in our minds, it's people being like, the hurricane has made land at, you know, this beach. But lots of times it's actually like, you know, going to a hurricane party, got some wine. And you're like, okay, that's, that's less than useful. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, those are those are two yeah. of the big projects um, that we have, yeah, and yeah. Uh, kind of more holistic bigger picture is I am kind of working towards. Um, I really would like to be able to put these kind of Haskell stream processors and Haskell data processors into production pretty easily. So I'm also working on a project in which it would be easier. It makes it very easy for us to deploy Haskell apps and just feed information into them and, and get information out. Um, uh, 
but that's an that's an infrastructural thing um, rather than uh, something that's a terribly cool use of Haskell. It's just a interesting kind of shim we're working on to um, get Haskell further into our production pipeline. At least, and by, by we, I mean primarily me. <laughs> right, right, okay. So, what advice do you have for us or anybody else uh, trying to get Haskell adopted within the organization? Because we see a lot of people in our trial use beta. A good part says, "Oh, I'm a you know passionate Haskeller, but I'm working in a Java shop and I'm right. trying to convince my bosses, you know, to use it." Uh, so, what are some ways, techniques, things that uh, that, that you think could be useful? So, one thing that I've I've kind of thought about is that you know a lot of people attribute the success of Ruby to that uh, original you know start a blog in five minutes Rails tutorial, so people could immediately see some problem on the internet. Um, I, which is I want to have a blog or I want to make my own blog. And the answer to that question is a framework and a, and a, and a language, Rails and Ruby, respectively. Um, I think one thing that could be useful for, you know, for Haskell to find wider adoption is since, a, since Haskell itself and a lot of its users come from a sort of academic background, a lot of what's presented of the benefits of Haskell are just the raw speed as well as these kind of, um, you know, abstract, you know, uh, category theory um, kind of um, sophistications of thought and, you know, abstractions. And those are really compelling to somebody like me. And this is why I was kind of, uh, I kind of got into it because, you know, it's, it's, it's things I've been always interested in. I've always been interested in math. I've always been interested in abstract algebra and category theory. You know, um, these are the just kind of things that, happen to work with me also being a web developer for the New York Times, those interests having no overlap. I think one thing that would make Haskell have a lot more adoption is if there could be a focus with some of these libraries and with some of the code examples on how to answer people's questions for problems they actually um, routinely encounter without having themselves to be kind of high level you know, programmers, you know, what could somebody with very little experience in Haskell do very productively within the first, you know, you know five hours of, of their, their experience with it, you know, and because that's always the question people get with me, it's like, oh, you know, what's the benefit of it? I'm like, well, it can run fast. And they're like, yeah, but I'm not really like a, you know, like a, a woodcutter, you know, I don't, I don't really have that kind of like, you know, Olympic mentality of like A beats B by so long. My programs don't need to run fast. I cache everything or something like that. Right. And I think that, you know, that's been one tack we've seen a lot in, in the Haskell community. Oh, this runs X times faster. Or conversely, we, you know, they see things, all these category theory words, monad, not monoid, functor, et cetera, and they get intimidated as well. It'd be really cool. I think for me, the cell automata example is a great one. Um, even though that actually is mathematical as well, but just to be like, oh, you can model this thing in terms of process rather than, um, you know, kind of, uh, you know, an ontology of being, ontology of process rather than one of being. And just be like, here are some examples of where that thought wins you, you know, uh, get, gains you some benefit. Kind of show you the fun you can have with it, right? Um, it's hard for me to actually make up one of these examples because indeed this is a very hard thing to do. But I, I really, the time task really shines for me is where someone can show not just why one abstraction is interesting, but why one abstraction can allow you to model things or talk about things that you couldn't even talk about without a huge amount of, uh, you know, overhead in libraries and code. So that, that's one thing um, for sure. The other thing is also, in general, I feel the Haskell documentation for libraries is incredibly good, but the actual how-tos, the like how to take this library and do something useful with it right away are often lacking, especially compared to like Ruby gems, which lots of times like in their GitHub or whatever, they'll have like a little mini tutorial, like here's how to do the minimal viable cool thing with this. And I think that, um, you know, you guys have done really a great job with doing that for the conduits library, for example. There's a lot of great posts on FP Complete about how to um, use conduits for various things, how to use it in a practical way, in a very real way. And, that, and if that could be extended to some of these other libraries, um, uh, it would be, I think, very, very useful to, um, you know, to uh, first-time users of, of, of these. You know, a great example is like the, the parsing libraries, like Add a Parsec. Um, uh, it takes a long time, I think, at least, for somebody to open up the Add a Parsec library and get to the point where they're actually successfully parsing something. <laughs> um, and I think that if there was just a, you know, here's how to use Add a Parsec to parse the mm. Twitter stream or something like that, like just right away. 
Uh, it would be it would, it would it helped adoption enormously because otherwise you come in you see all these function signatures um, and you pretty immediately are like I have to wade right. through a lot just to get to the kind of hello right. world. No, we totally library. agree with you, and we're trying our best with our own efforts plus the community help to push the practical aspects of this. You know, to to make the barriers to adoption yes. much much lower practical for the rest of us who who are not uh, math savvy, for example. In fact, that's what it comes down to. Exactly. Exactly. Well, what about the business benefits? You know, now I assume you have proven yourself. The Haskell has proven itself. So you've gone to the stage where perhaps you can expand the adoption Haskell. Maybe hire another guy to do more things. Potentially, I, you know, we can talk about that. But as far as the in the beginning, what business uh, benefit uh, pitches you need uh, for the hired ups to buy you something, let's say, and that we have customers like that. You know, we have a commercial IDE, as you know. And uh, so some people say, "Well, you know, it's great. It's you know very fast and great. I have to deal with the cabal tool chain, all that stuff. But I can't justify it to my boss because right now I'm just doing it personally. So I need to have right. some business um, language, business lingo, justification. You know, faster, cheaper. Yeah, it all comes down to that. What, mean, what are some of the things you you need, you, you suggest? I mean, honestly, the most compelling business thing, and I kind of alluded to this earlier, that I can say about this is it allows me to do on my laptop, you know, a 13-inch MacBook Air, right? Um, what otherwise we would have to do on a cluster of servers or, you know, spin up some, you know, you know, some EC extra large or a compute cluster or something like that to achieve similar. Like, I see a lot of my coworkers that do um, – you know, statistical analysis or, you know, um, you know, the people that do our stats parsing, you know, for our website and things like that, they, they spin up these like Hadoop clusters or things like that, that are actually pretty expensive. Um, and then they have, and then, you know, I can't count how many times someone forgets to spin one down, <laughs> you know, the actual running time itself is expensive. You, the development time is hard because it's hard to model on a small limited resource machine and being able to actually say, not only can I model this to my machine, but I can run it, the production data set on my machine in a reasonable amount of time means I don't have to ask my boss for a server. So if there is some expense that is incurred by this, you know, maybe it's a, you know, a commercial, uh, commercial, you know, library ID or something like that, it's pretty quickly offset just by, you know, the amount of time I don't have to spend on EC2. <laughs> Well, and, and the hard dollar cost that you're talking yeah. about, which is really specific to this particular case because of the mass amount of data you got, right? right. But for, for more other so sort of general purpose things, maybe that, that part of it doesn't figure in as far as having you do servers or clusters, right? So it's more in the I don't know, developer productivity or quality of the product, something yeah, like that. Yeah, I mean, the other, the other thing is also it's, it's always really easy to, at least for me, to make the case of um, – the vast majority of bugs we do end up finding in our, you know, kind of server side code or whatever are like edge cases, you know, um, you know, oh, we hadn't, we don't know what happens when a user puts a number in for that or false in for that or something like that. And, you know, I know this is kind of the canned, you know, why is, uh, you know, statically strong type language good, but, you know, it, I have to say it, it does it, it does. It, there's truth to it, right? And you know, I don't have to worry about that. And we have these things like Quick Check, which make me, you know, rest incredibly well, knowing that I don't have to worry about what happens if a user sends a zero to this endpoint, because I've always been provisioning for this endpoint to only receive integers or strings or something like that. And in fact, if I want it to provision it to uh, receive more than that, I would have difficulty doing so. <laughs> um, so I, there's, you know, it's much these edge cases. These, you know, oh, we have to spend hours and hours rooting through these bugs that almost always come down to a false where we are expecting a null or something like that. I, I don't even have to worry about that. You know, the amount of bugs, I, the bugs I actually had to end up troubleshooting my fashion code were almost always problems with the input images being corrupted or something like that um, and having to be able to throw away images that were you know, wrong. <laughs> but I never had a problem that was, you know, something like, oh, when the image is, you know, this size or something like that, something weird happens when this is a very common problem we've had with other things. You know, the input is so sanitized in the hassle world that I have very, very uh, low reservations with rolling it out public facing. Right. It's hard to mess up. Right, right. Well, though, given all the benefits, though, yeah, I was alluding to the, the fact that you've proven it yourself many times over with the Haskell. 
And yeah. with, with the sort of the huge amounts of data now, everybody wants to do elections. Uh, in fact, I just saw it was a couple of weeks ago, a month ago, there was a it was analysis of the marriage announcements, all the different names. Oh you yeah, see that oh, one. Well, that, that seems like it perfectly could be used for Haskell kind of things too, right? The evolution of whatever the, you know, social. And it's great. The graphs are up very clearly differences in the names and what happened. No, right. absolutely. No, that's I mean that's exactly the thing that I would one of the things I would reach for for Haskell for. Is there a possibility now that uh, New York Times will adopt this even you know more, more I, because I'm, of all the benefits, huge benefits? I, I'm really pushing it. I mean, again, yeah. again, the objection is always you know if you get hit by a bus, Eric, how are we going to have another Haskell expert? But you know, I get, get another one. Isn't that the answer? Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> okay. Yeah. You know, right. Uh, Get another one is, 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 is the, is absolutely the answer. Um, unfortunately, my team, you know, isn't explicitly tasked with the duty of data analysis. There are other teams internally that we, we have like a consumer insights team, which does all of our business right, right. statistics. We have a computer assist reporting team, which does a lot of these statistics for our reporters. And we have a graphics team, which does a lot of our, you know, um, data analysis right. for maps and graphics. So part of the problem is, is, the team, the the load of like data processing is so shifted around that it's you know that no one team right. just does that. You know, I spend just as much time data processing as I do developing user interfaces, you know, in JavaScript, you know, mm-hmm. um, or doing you know implementing mm-hmm. a design from a design team with CSS and stuff. You know, so since our jobs are so kind of multiform, it's it's, it's you know hard to say well we do so much of this that we need another person. Um, however, I, I definitely don't think that uh, it's. It, I, I think that we're only going to see more experimental languages embraced here. I think that you know already languages like Go, um, you know, in Clojure, we have a guy uh, David Nolan who does a lot of the Clojure development. Uh, he, he works on Clojure's logic libraries, um, and uh, you know, we have uh, our sysadmin guy is really into Go. I think people are more and more starting to break down this misconception that we can't use languages that are. Um, you know, less widely known within the team. Um, we just have to get enough people comfortable with it. So my personal evangelism, I think, is is is, is go- hopefully going to win out the day. But in the end, it's all results too. So I mean, you know, you, you guys have internal, you know, lunch, brown bagging lunches, whatever, to, to show these guys, the, the stat guys, the, the data processing people, yeah. right? The big data ish is sort of groups. I don't know what tools they're yeah. using. You know, you, sh- you should show them, man. Uh, this is this is much better for you. Make your life better. Oh, I mean, I've already had some of the people that you know run uh, these you know Hadoop clusters for Python processes or whatever, um, like see, see my results and like start to be like, maybe I should pick this up <laughs> because you know uh, it, there's just a lot of problems that are really easy to work through when you can say like, if it fits in memory, it works. Thank you so much. Have a good day.